record now. Okay. So today marks uh, a departure in our coverage. Uh, last time I had made similar remarks because we were transitioning to system dynamics module. And today we're going to be transitioning from one tradition or diagrammatic approach within system dynamics. Uh, I realized I should share the screen here um, to another. Specifically, last time we were together on Thursday, we discussed causal loop diagramming. And indeed, one of the components of assignment one involves a causal loop diagramming exercise. Okay. Um, it's easy to look at it and think it's simple. It's not simple. Um, to create a really crafted causal loop diagram takes work. Um, uh, and uh, there's an art as well as a science to building up a causal loop diagram. Causal loop diagrams um, have a kind of economy of, of what they show in terms of the variables, the links between them, associated with the polarity. And we spent quite a bit of time on Thursday discussing the assumptions behind that. And we discussed how, well, it's easy to look at this and take it purely at face value. Behind the scenes, there's actually more going on, more going on in terms of composition of end-to-end -end arrows by which they can they, the, the signs of the two combine according to the rule of signs. Remember that? A minus and a minus composed to be a what? A plus. A plus and a minus composed to be a what? A net minus. And that induces some link by, by extension, there is some link from smoking to commitment to cessation here that's a plus link with a delay, I might add, um, that's implied by this. And one of the most important things that means is any path that's now associated with a, a net polarity from any starting point along that path to any destination along that path, and every loop has a polarity implied for it based on the polarities of each piece. You understand that point, right? Okay. Um, so I'm I'm asking you in assignment one to, to try your hand some more at flashing out some ideas. Um, but we, we talked more than that. We, we talked about, at least we gestured at the fact that when, we, when we're dealing with causal diagrams, there are archetypical behaviors associated with certain types of loops. So positive loops tend to be associated with reinforcing behavior, snowballing behavior, or by a little change gets amplified and amplified and amplified and amplified. Maybe it's one person infects two and they infect four and they infect eight, 16, and you know where that goes. Right? Uh, until it's limited by some other loop, like depletion of susceptibility. And so this leads to, taken by itself, a positive feedback leads to unstable behavior and self-reinforcing behavior that, because of the basic mathematics involved, is most commonly exponential. Mm -hmm. You can think of it as three times. It goes up geometrically between those times two, four, eight, sixteen, right? But in continuous time, it's what we term exponential. You either the alpha two. Mm -hmm. And this is this sort of behavior is very common in real world systems. This is behavior associated with tipping points often, where once you reach a tipping point, it, it sort of drives itself forward faster and faster. Mm -hmm. Associated with, you know, spread of rumors or conspiracy theories and adverse cases with, with um, sales of a popular new service or product. 
By contrast, negative feedback loops are associated with stabilizing the atrium, where the system seeks balance and an equilibrium. Because the change at any one point leads to a ripple through effect that does what? That does what? So a change in one thing, maybe it's the you know vaccine complacency arise in that leads to a ripple through effect that ends up doing what? Yeah, balancing, pushing back against the original thing. So here. An increase of vaccine complacency means fewer people are vaccinated, which means more susceptibles out there in the population, bigger outbreaks. Think not just COVID-19, but think pertussis or think measles. These, these childhood infectious diseases that kill kids, which for many decades were well controlled, but people become complacent for that because of that. It leads to a greater number of susceptibles, more outbreaks. We're starting to see outbreaks, shockingly, if you had told someone from the 1980s or 1970, because they had achieved massive public health gains by, by big vaccination campaigns that wipes out these scourges of earlier generation. And if you had told them, now we're going to start seeing outbreaks again because people are getting so complacent, they would have been shocked. They would have thought, surely people are, are wiser than that. And that those outbreaks then undercut vaccine complacency. So in a negative feedback, a change in a certain direction leads to a cascading set of changes that's pushed back against in the opposite direction. It pushes back against that original thing, right? I grow hunger, I eat food, and it lessens my hunger. People good with that idea. I mean, that's the negative feedback group. I, I'll be seeking to make sure you folks remember this well. And so this is pop quizable, and it's also, I'd be surprised if it's not on the exam. How's that? Uh, the pens come out. Um, okay. Uh, and when you have delays, it leads to oscillatory behavior. Behavior where it oscillates, it, it sort of, uh, it goes towards some equilibrium but there's delays. It's like steering on an icy road and you fish tail around because there's a delay. And when you realize, oh, you you're you're you know not slowing down enough, you should have slowed down earlier, et cetera. And you 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 sort of uh, fish tail around. Um, and when you have interacting loops, you get behaviors out of the results uh, that that interact, like this sort of behavior where. You know, initially exponential growth from a from a positive feedback loop, uh, and that depletes uh, some resource, which is a negative loop over means a negative loop over time and sort of balances out and it goes to some by itself it goes to some plateau. We see this all around us society. The results of different interacting loops. So loops tell stories. Loops lead to certain types of behavior. It's not a hard and fast rule. We can't simulate a system of these sort of loops uniquely, but it but it um, gives us some insights often about where certain behaviors are coming from. So causal loops are, are nothing, they're not a small matter. They're not a sort of trivial thing that it's just a way of sort of slapping down some, some connections without insights. They do generate insights. They do give rise to, to insights. And often with a causal diagram like, like this, but much bigger, something closer to maybe this, um, we, we might have uh, some reasoning that goes on about for particular variables, the number of loops on which it's located. There are certain variables that are gateways between areas of the model. We can look at what's called between this centrality. Look at some that serve as kind of keystone variables that govern multiple loops. And if only we could modify them, we could shape multiple loops at once. So when we have diagrams that are large, often we learn from them by putting them together and we can compute, compute um, quantities on them. So these diagrams are nothing to 
to sneeze at. I mean, they are they 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 can give a lot of insight. And one thing that I should have emphasized that you know when I was going around and asking about reason to model, some people bring together stakeholders to share understanding, to share perspectives, to understand where people agree and where there are differences, and use models for that purpose. That is a purpose of modeling to sort of disseminate understanding of of different different viewpoints on a situation, but you can go a lot further than that with, with models as well. But today, we're transitioning to this level of, of further analysis. And we're going to be shortly in this area of stop and flow down. The video is actually on that. But I want to talk about this issue of system structure diagrams, which are this intermediate point. Here, we have stock and flows distinguished, but we don't get any equation. And what I'm going to argue, what I'm going to submit to you is that as we go from these diagrams at the top, the causal loop diagrams, the system structure diagrams, down to stock and flow diagrams, there's a progressive sharpening going on, a progressive elaboration. We get more precise in our hypotheses about what's going on in the system. That doesn't mean they're more accurate necessarily, but we take more and more specific, we, 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 that, we, we take a stance of more and more specific beliefs about what's going on. We we sharpen our articulation of the structure of that system. We go from causal loop, offer a lot of value, to system structure diagrams, and then to stock and flow. System structure diagrams, like stock and flow, cannot be simulated. There's not enough information. There are no formulas that say how much you know, this flow depends on this stock. We simply capture that it depends on this stock. But you do distinguish what's a flow and what's a stop. Mm -hmm. and that may seem to you, without simulation, a minor matter. No, why, 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 why go through all this distinguishing stops and flows if you're not going to simulate? Well, that's a very good reason. Because distinguishing, the very act of distinguishing a stock from the flow into and out of it, for example, a flow into and out of it, actually brings additional insights to bear beyond what we get up in causal loop diagrams. It sharpens our understanding. It gives us an extra lens to understand system behavior. Specifically, when we have a stock which has some flows into it, and some flows out of it. There's an understanding that emerges from how the value of those flows over time relate to the value of the stock over time. The fact that one is a stock and the others are flows tells us a lot about their behavior. And the primary lens by which we understand that the primary types of insights we get have to do with this relationship between inflows and outflows. And from this floor, I have argued before you uh, something about this reason. So you, you're going to tell me. I expect you'll be able to tell me. We have a stock. Maybe it's a stock of people who are currently users of a product. And inflow maybe is new adoptions of that product, and outflow is people who used to use the product but no longer do. Or maybe it's a service. Right? Right. People using the service right now is the, is the stock. People joining the service is the inflow, and people leaving the service is the outflow. Or maybe it's people in a hospital ward with the inflow state. Those would be the what? Mm -hmm. New admissions, yeah, to that board. New people being added in. Outflows would be what? 
Yeah, it could be recovered if people being discharged from the war. Um, we hope that they'll be discharged because they're recovered, right? Now, if the inflows, the net inflows, if we were to sum up all the inflows, there may be more than one inflow, you know, uh, flow. If we were to sum those all up, if that's larger than the sum of the outflows, what is the stock going to be doing? Over time. Well, huh? mm -hmm. It'll be, yes, it'll be going up over time, right? And the analogy I've given is what? Anyone? A bathtub. We have water coming in faster than it's leaving. So it's going to be a few minutes, right? Water's coming into the toilet faster than it's leaving. The toilet level goes up, right? Mm -hmm. Better read for the point of person. Mm -hmm. if, if the inflow is equal to the outflow, what do we expect to say? Uh, so, uh, Nate, here. Equilibrium. And what, what specifically does that mean? The value of the stock will be doing what over time? Sorry? Yes, but, but the value of the stock is doing what? The result is. So when you say equilibrium, what does it mean? Yeah, but you said the stock's in equilibrium. So what does that mean? How does it value change over time? No, I mean, if, if it value, if, it, if the thought is in equilibrium, it means that its value is, um, yes, stay constant. Stay constant. That's right. It does not change over time. Right? Um, stay constant. Uh, if the inflow is less than the outflow, what do we expect? Yes, uh, name? Part. Uh, the stock is going down over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we comfortable with that? If people are coming in, then the stock is going up. People are, if, if people are coming in quicker than they're leaving, then the stock is going up. People are leaving quicker than they're coming in, then the value of stock is going down. If people are coming in at the same rate that they're leaving, if five people walk into the store in a given minute and five leave in that same minute, the number of people in the store after that minute is what? The same, right? It's different people in the store, but it's the same. Are we good with that? So th this may seem like a minor matter. This may seem like Something that's evident, self evident, obvious, but it's not. When you're dealing with a system in the world, you're, you're reading about it. Maybe it's the number of people in the hospital for COVID 19. Maybe it's, um, it's factors involving the number of active cases of COVID 19 right now. Maybe it's the number of people with diabetes in the population. What have you? We can get actually a lot of understanding because we'll be seeing changes in that over time. Maybe it's going up. And that tells us something about the inflows and outflows. It doesn't tell us exactly what they are, but it tells us one is greater than the other, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and simply, if it's stable, it means the two are equal. And it turns out, can learn a great deal by reading time series, by looking at data over time and remembering these basic principles. You can learn something about how effective we are in finding new cases compared to the rate at which cases recover, for example. Um, we can learn something about the underlying drivers for the flows sometimes by reasoning about this this sort of relationship. Okay, so this what I'm trying to tell you is that when it comes to inference, I'll be with you in just a minute, Daniel. When we go from a causal loop diagram and this sort of reasoning, um, so from causal loop diagrams, we get a great potential for insights. 
Um, there's there's a lot of extra, you know, a lot of understanding you can gain from those. But with system structure diagrams, even without equations, even without formulas, the fact that you have stocks and you articulate which variables are stocks and what the flows are to them, flows in, flows out, you can gain actually quite a lot of insight that's quite practical. Um, and that insight is going to be well beyond what someone not trained in these methods is often going to come away with the film that talk to. And um, I don't think there are any well situations where the inflow can match the outflow and it's you know, almost wiped out as soon as it gets there. Uh, so it, that it can't reach the value of, uh, of the outflow. Yeah. So in that case, the stock would be going down, or yeah, it would be going down at different rates over the top. There are cases where potentially that can occur, but a lot of quantity that we deal with in the world are physical quantities where it can't go negative. Um, you know, the number of people in war, or in a store, you know, about the war, they're in a store, or the number of cars on the road which were of a, of a certain age category, therefore a certain emission profile. But, but there are a lot of cases where you can get trouble with the outflow fully fully catching up to the inflow. So sometimes it can be gone up. One, one case I'll point out here, you know, a seriously non-trivial thing. Um, so my colleague, John Sturman at MIT, esteemed colleague, the author of Hormuz's textbook on system dynamics called Business Dynamics. Um, he, um, he spent a lot of time using system dynamics models to discuss climate data. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. It's, it's remarkable. It's inspiring to see how far you can get with basic stock and flow reasoning. I'll give an example. The, if we consider CO2, carbon dioxide, the primary driver for anthropogenic climate change, for human-induced climate change in the atmosphere, um, is, is CO2 emissions. Methane also, also has, a, has a even bigger impact per unit, but the levels of carbon dioxide emissions are a lot higher. But the stock of carbon dioxide is an extremely important if you look at lots of analyses of, uh, of uh, climate change, a lot of what they're focused on is the number of parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's basically the size of the stock. And a lot of policy in, in system, in any sort of system, most policy will of necessity be dealing with the flow. You can't change the stock directly. It has to change it through flows, like some sort or not flows out, flows in. And what will be some of the flows into the stock of carbon dioxide uh, relevant to human human activity? Industrial yeah, emissions from from uh, from uh, factories, for example. Another one is transportation. From transportation, from Vehicles of different, different, um, you know, age and emissions profile. Uh, what's uh, another one? Got a name? Yeah, from Jessica. Um, from farming. Yeah. So there's some carbon dioxide might be generated, for example, from uh, from livestock farming in some cases, um, or from just CO two from uh, decaying vegetation from associated with with farming. Yes, and. Uh, remind me, Connor. Yeah. From energy generation, from plants that keep us warm in the winter, right? Uh, Etc. So those are various flows into the stock of carbon dioxide. What are some flows out of carbon dioxide? Yes. Excellent. Carbon sinks like trees. There's carbon sinks associated with with ocean, oceanic circulation. Or, uh, certain types of water, you know, at different temperatures capturing it. And, and for example, in the AMOC, the um, Atlantic Meridional uh, Circulation 
um, where where there's different uh, uh, temperature and, and saltiness profiles associated with water. Right now, a lot of carbon is captured and put into the deep ocean by the sinking of water uh, during that circulation. Yes, now. How does it say? Well, kind of building on the same point, but by the way, in the water, the form of housing carbon is in that. It's easy to bury it. Yeah, buried underground or in oceanic environments, there are certain types of, 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 of organisms that capture it. Yeah, they have industrial carbon Industrial carbon capture, like the boundary dam project in southern Sustain. So those are very flows out. But one of the points here is that it's it's easy for people um to reason about kind of um sometimes a bit too glibly, you know, if we could cut emissions by a certain amount, if we could reduce emissions by 10% over the next 10 years, 20%. And it's easy for people to get in the mindset that that's somehow directly reducing the stock. But does it reduce the stock directly? No, it reduces the flow into the stock. And, and even after you reduce the inflow into the stock of carbon dioxide, say by 10%, if, if the inflow is still greater than the outflow, what's going to be going on with that stock of carbon dioxide? It's still going to be rising, right? So people often confuse these two. They confuse the flow thinking, okay, we reduce the flow by 10%, we're gonna reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by 10%, or at least we're gonna be reducing it over time, right? And it's not necessarily so, because you reduce it by 10%, but it's still greater than the outflow. It's still gonna be going up over time. Maybe this gives you some clue about why I'm emphasizing when I say, for a cause of leak diagramization, K goes up, B goes up relative to the value it otherwise would have had, not necessarily over time. It's because it doesn't always translate decreasing emissions, the decreasing the flow into a stock of carbon dioxide doesn't always mean the stock of carbon dioxide will go down as a result. It may just go up less quickly. I mean, it will go up slower. It's so, a subtle point. Very easy for people to fall into the trap, to get confused about this. Think that one translates to the other. Okay. Um, it's easy to think, oh, it's obvious. So, you know, these things are 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 straightforward or are, are self-evident. But in fact, human beings are are quite poor at reasoning about these things um off the seat of the pit. You have to really stop and think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to be doing now with the pop quiz. Okay, so uh, I'd like to ask um, everyone here to uh, spread out so there's a space between everyone. So in the back row there, uh, I need two of you folks to move about up here, move to this row. Um, and we're looking at any other people doing that with each other. No, okay, we're, we're good. So uh, two people from that back row uh, up here, and I think we're good. And we're going to administer now a pop quiz that builds on this learning. So I'm going to stop the recording.